All right, hi everybody. It's time uh, for the meeting now. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. So the first topic is about uh, the community file system. So hi, uh, my name is Lisa Gerhard. I'm in the data and analytics group here at NERSC, and I'm here with a bunch of members from this. It's not showing as a presentation. I don't even know how to uh, uh, present. I click present. I think, I think the problem is I didn't click present before I hit share. Yeah, is that better? Okay, okay. sorry about that. Um, so I'm here with a, a bunch of members from the storage team. Um, Christy Callback Rose, Greg Butler, thank you, Kat, <laughs> Carol Lizinski, and a few others remote um, to talk to you guys about the new community file system that's going to be deployed. Um, so uh, we've got some slides, but feel free to jump in with questions if you go as we go. Um, so, uh, um, okay. So, why are we why are we deploying the community file system? Um, so, the community file system is an essential part of NERSC's long term storage plan. Um, our users here at NERSC have a need to store for long term um, scientific data that's being accessed. Um, Lots of people access data for multiple years, um, and we need a place where that can be um, quickly accessed um, and staged up to our more performance year for analysis. Um, users also have a need. Um, this also serves a need to share your scientific data over the web. Um, data sets are growing uh, over time, uh, and we need a larger and larger space uh, to share this data. Um, so this, the community file system will replace the project file system and serve these needs um, for the NERSC users. Um, it's going to have, yeah, it'll be uh, on all our files, all our com computational systems, and it will be used by our scientific portals and in SPIN. Um, so this is, this is coming. This is scheduled for replacement with a new allocation year, January 14th. The, the transition will begin. We'll have some more details on that. And ultimately, it will place the project file system and also our sponsored storage project A file system, but not, not for some time. Um, so what's new with the community file system? Um, the main new thing here is space. Um, it's an, almost an order of magnitude increase in space that's available for users. Um, we'll have roughly 60 petabytes um, before the rate that's available for users. Uh, the plan is to increase this to about 200 petabytes over the next five years. <clears throat> to, in order to scale with the space needs of our users. Um, the default quota for directories on the community file system um, will go to 20 terabytes. It's one terabyte now in the project file system, so by default, repos will get 20 terabytes um, and 20 million inodes. Um, we also are offering uh, better quota management for sub-projects inside of a repo. Um, we've gotten a lot of requests from PIs over the years to be able to have um, sub-projects inside of their on their file system with separate quotas so that they can manage the different uh, requirements of their project that way. Um, this will be possible on the community file system. You can have separate directories that are all owned by your repo that will have individual quotas for them. And you can split your total, total, your total quota amongst these directories as you like. Um, it's also a new allocation model. Um, the quotas that, that repos get on the community file system will be granted by the DOE allocations manager um, as part of the ERCAP process. So in the ERCAP, you'll ask for the space that you need, and you did it this year. Um, and then the DOE managers will consider that and, and grant all or some or whatever they choose for that, and nurse will follow that. Um, so it also comes with a lot of nice new file system features. Um, we'll have faster rebuild for distributed RAID. Um, what that means to you is that if there's a file system issue, um, the performance won't be impacted for as long. Um, we also have the ability to, to do end-to-end -end check, checksums um, to ensure data integrity. Um, and we have a new feature where we can have sub-blocks, uh, which will allow for more efficient use um, of the capacity, um, especially for the small files, of which we do have a considerable amount of NERSC. Um, so that's what we do, those new features um, staying the same for the community file system. So just like with the project file system, every repo will have a directory of the same name by default. Everyone gets at least one. Um, when your repo is created, it's automatically created on the file system. Um, like I said before, if you need multiple directories, you can write to us and request multiple directories, and, and that can be done. 
Um, the group permissions will remain the same as they are on project. Um, so you'll, each directory will be re readable and writable by default, um, will be owned by the PI, uh, and read and writable by the Linux group of the same name as the repo. Um, so we have um, so we have an example right down here um, of what, yeah, I see he's asking that snapshot, yes, which I'll get to in just a sec. Um, we have an example of what this looks like on the file system. Um, the new path will be global CFS seeders, and then it'll be your repo name. So project projectors is replaced by CFS seeders. Um, and this is the permissions it'll have here. This is the one for end staff. It's owned by Sadiq, uh, it's group read and writable, and the sticky bit is set. Um, so this is all the same as on the, with the exception of the new path name, the group permissions are the same as on the project file system. Um, the community file system will be mounted on every system. It'll be mounted on Cori, it'll be mounted on Nurse 9 and mounted on our DTNs. Um, we'll have the same retirement policy that we have now for project. Um, inactive repos are migrated to HPSS after a year. We also have the same purging and backup um, capability that we have on project, uh, as on project. So CFS is not purged um, and you have seven days of backups from the snapshots. So we do have the snapshot capability on, on community file system. So a, a word on uh, deployment details. Um, so NERSC staff is going to migrate your data from the project file system. You don't need to do anything, we'll move your data for you. And in fact, they're working hard on this right now. Um, the project file system, so we're, what we're doing is we're syncing the data over, but in order to make sure that we get a final and complete sync of the data, we need a period of time where the project file system is read only, where it's not being changed. Um, and so that's going to start uh, January 14th, the beginning of the new allocation year, it will become read only. The project file system will remain read only for that a week until January 21st. Um, we're going to make every effort that we can to return the file system to you earlier, um, but this is how long we estimate it will take. Um, so if you feel this will cause a major hardship for your group, please reach out to Nurse Consulting and we'll work with you to try and mitigate this. Um, so once this is deployed, um, the old path uh, at project projectors will actually stay around. It will point at the new community file system um, until sometime in mid-2020 when we, we retire that. Um, and that's so that you don't have to rush to upgrade your scripts. If anything points at project, it'll still work. Um, it'll just be writing and reading from the new community file system. So there's a question, is the read-only thing apply to project A? No, just project. Just project. Yeah nor Project B or any of those others. Project is the only one that will be read-only. That's the only one that we're migrating the data from. Project A, I have a slide on that a little later and we'll talk about that more in detail um, for those of you who have the sponsored storage. Okay. So the old path will stick around. However, we encourage you to, once this migration data migration is done, to go through and upgrade your scripts um, and change project projectors to CFS seeders um, so that you won't be caught flat-footed when this does go away. Uh, services that run in SPIN, the science gateways, your scripts will continue to work if they're pointed at project. We're gonna do some link manipulation on all these systems so that this will hold true across all of NERSC. Um, we're also adding a new um, variable in the dot .files, uh, CFS. Um, which will contain global CFS seeders. So you can just say seeder dollar CFS and then the name of the repo um, to try and cut down on the amount you have to type. Um, and again, even though the old path works, we recommend you migrate your scripts to the new path. It's not just the scripts, it's like the sim links. Scripts, yes, also a good point. Greg reminds me that if you guys have sim links that are directly pointing at project projectors, you're gonna to need to update those because those will break when you take this away. Okay, so this is a, a little sketch um, of kind of where we are and where we're going. Um, so here, right now, we've got the project file system. Um, it's read and write. Um, it's visible at both slash project and global project. Right now, we're gonna do a month of data transfer. Um, so the, the community file system is present on the systems, uh, but it can't be, re can't be written to by anyone but root. Um, and it'll stay like that until January 14th. Um, then during the query maintenance project will become mounted read-only. Community file system will stay um, read-only uh, for those seven days. Um, 
And then when community is deployed, uh, the community file system will become read write. We'll be able to access it at slash project, global project, and global CFS. Um, but of course, global CFS is the preferred way. Um, so now just a, a quick slide on sponsored storage. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, NERSC allows some groups to spawn, purchase large blocks of storage on a separate file system. Um, these existing sponsored storage purchases will be honored till the end of their um, contract. At a later date, um, where these spaces may be migrated onto the community file system, uh, but you know, the space will still be yours for the time that you've purchased it. Uh, going forward, we'd like our community file system to handle most of the volume of these sponsored storages. Um, so we're, we will only consider sponsored storage for purchases that are larger than a petabyte. Previously, the threshold, I think, was 50 terabytes. We're raising this to a petabyte. Um, and those new purchases will not be on a separate file system, but they'll be integrated onto the community file system. Um, we're also going to only consider buying more storage for sponsored storage twice a year um, to try and help people consolidate purchases if they need to, to get to this one petabyte. But in general, if you have a large storage need, um, that should be communicated to your DOE allocation manager and should flow through them um, so that we can better, um, better serve our priorities, better give you the storage that you need. So I think that's all I have. Um, I just want to say we sort of have had an unbalanced file system hierarchy for a while. We have a very large HPSS tape archive. Project has been undersized for the use for a long time. Um, and so we're going back to a more traditional approach of a, a tiered storage that I think should make data management easier um, for all the users at NERSC. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now or reach out to us at, at uh, help.nurse.gov uh, and we'll work with you. Great, thanks Lisa. Any questions? Hi, this is Stephen. Um, what should the expectations be for metadata performance and throughput compared to project? The throughput will be um, greater than 100 gigabyte per second aggregate. Um, we just completed some performance testing last week. Um, the metadata performance, um, the testing that we did, um, I think for a second, um, we had a goal of doing uh, 300,000 um, ops per second read and write. Um, from just a moment, 32 clients, um, and we well exceeded that. It was more on the order of uh, 400,000 to 500,000 ops per second. Um, I'm happy to share the results of that testing with you. Those numbers are interesting to you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, then let's uh, move on to our next topic. So our next topic is using Desk and Jupyter. Right, thanks. You get set up here. Okay, um, I'm Roland Thomas. I'm from the Data and Analytics Services Group here at NERSC. Uh, I take care of Python and Jupyter on Cori here. And I thought it would be a good time for us to talk about how to use Dask uh, through Jupyter on Cori here at NERSC. Um, if you're not familiar with what Dask does or what it is, these first couple of slides are for you. Uh, the story starts with Python. Python is now the dominant language for data analytics and general programming, uh, and, and for general programming, and it's also a major platform for machine learning and deep learning, and that's definitely true here at NERSC. This growth has been fueled by a number of factors that include uh, easy to use computational libraries like NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, the scientific Python stack, libraries for visualization like Matplotlib, Seaborn, Bokeh, and tools for interactivity and sharing, uh, which are becoming ever more popular, uh, Jupyter Notebooks and the Jupyter ecosystem in particular. Um, now the problem is that these tools were not designed to scale really beyond being used on a single machine, and that's where Dask comes in. Dask is a scalable analytics platform that is supposed to work well with these Python-based tools. It's developed specifically to scale up, 
uh, with the Python ecosystem and to serve multi-core machines, distributed uh, clusters, uh, university clusters, and now high performance computing. Um, I'll just say also that um, this slide and the next slide are adapted from the DASC documentation. I didn't just write them myself. There's a very nice website about DASC with lots of documentation that you can read uh, later. So here's a big picture of how DASC works. If you've used Spark before, it will be um, pretty familiar to you. With DASC, what you do is you start a cluster of some processes on some hardware. It consists of a single uh, scheduler, some number of workers, generally many more than one, maybe 100 workers, um, and a few other um, handy processes are, are, are there as part of the cluster, including the dashboard. Um, and part of why we're talking about this now is that we've, um, we've done some work to make accessing this dashboard um, through Jupyter easier for our users. Um, now, there are many ways to start um, these DAS clusters. We're going to focus on one today, especially because it leverages Cori Compute nodes. Um, but there are other ways to do it, and you may even be able to just do it in, in Jupyter without using Compute nodes. That's fine. Just observe the usual um, uh, recommendations about remembering that it's a shared resource. It's like the login node. Um, don't take all the cores for more than a couple of minutes at most. Okay. Uh, be a good neighbor. So um, then what do you do with this cluster once you've started it up? Um, you build this client object, you instantiate a client object, and you use that to chat with the scheduler from a script or from a Jupyter notebook. Um, what I mean by talk to the client is that we're going to send tasks, work that we want done uh, through the client to the scheduler. Um, and um, these are going to be um, scheduled by the cluster dynamically, by the scheduler dynamically. Um, there are modes of operation that can be kind of immediate and very highly interactive. Um, uh, evaluation of the tasks is lazy, uh, returning futures and promises that you can feed into other tasks. So um, your notebook isn't blocked while these things are running. Um, also, DASC provides a number of very handy big data collections like data frames, um, the DASC delayed library, DASC arrays, and things like this that are useful for different um, for different purposes. And for communication, uh, it's, it's important to know that DASC uh, doesn't use MPI for communication. And this has, a, has an effect on how, how big it's going to scale on our system. Um, but uh, there's no reason why in the future it couldn't do something like that. It supports TCP, uh, InfiniBand, and UCX, which is fairly new. Uh, so why are we talking about DASC at NERSC right now? Um, the fact is more and more users have been asking about whether or not they can actually use it. Um, so we're trying to respond to those inquiries. Um, in particular, people want to use it from Jupyter because it's a data analytics platform for interactive uh, use. And also, um, we think that the DASC ecosystem has matured to the point that uh, it, it interacts with HPC better than it did in the past. So in this talk, we're going to talk a little bit about what best practices are for using DASC on Cori compute nodes. There's two, two main ways that we're advocating users um, try to do this right now. One is a, a package called DASC MPI, which just uses MPI to launch the cluster for you. Um, the communication of tasks and doing all the work is still done over TCP. Um, but this, this seems to work uh, really well to start up a cluster really fast. Um, there's also DASC job queue, which we're not going to talk about today. This is a mechanism for starting workers uh, by submitting batch jobs. So your scheduler runs outside of the uh, compute nodes, but you connect to workers as they start up. So you can kind of build up a cluster and the cluster can kind of tear down. And the scheduler can handle this um, going away, coming and going of workers very, very nicely. Uh, another best practice we want to highlight is that you should use containers probably in order to scale up launching maybe larger clusters around the size of like 50 to 100 workers. You probably want to put everything into a container and use um, a Jupyter kernel based on a container to do that probably. And if you're not going to, don't want to do that right away, you should probably at least leverage uh, global common software, uh, which is where we recommend people um, install uh, dynamically linked applications. And of course, Python is one of those. There's also a whole page about um, best practices for DASC on HPC that the DASC project itself. And so we recommend using that. So these are kind of our high level um, recommendations we're making right now about how to use DASC 
on the Cori compute nodes. Um, in addition to figuring this stuff out, we had to do some work on our own. We had to um, do some work on networking between the Jupyter nodes and the compute nodes on Cori. Also had to contribute some code to uh, some of the infrastructure in particular to make the dashboard work and um, uh, have a conversation with the developers. Okay, so um, I don't wanna just do a bunch of slides. I'd like to do a live demo. Um, the live demo is gonna consist of three notebooks and I don't have any backup movies. So either this is gonna work or it's not. So it's gonna be exciting. Um, the, the three notebooks I'm following, one is very, a uh, very simple way of starting up a DAS cluster on Cori Compute using DAS MPI and how to actually connect to the cluster and then how to start up and see the dashboard. Um, the second is going to be connecting to that cluster and doing a very simple kind of map reduce example calculation. The final one is a little bit more complicated DAS data frame space calculation that actually uses some real uh, data that I pre-processed. Um, these notebooks are gonna be posted uh, after the video conference today, and we're working on our documentation for DASC and they're changing pretty quickly. Um, hopefully that will settle down. Um, these notebooks contain a lot of useful documentation and explication uh, about what's going on. So you don't have to just remember what I'm, I'm saying as I click through. Um, you can adjust these notebooks and try to run them yourselves and we'll try to make that easier for people because I think that's a handy way to learn. And of course, if you get stuck doing any of this stuff, file a ticket. And, and will help. Um, the place where these notebooks are going to be posted is uh, going to be linked from docs.nurse.gov from the desk page there. Okay, so let's let's do the live demo. All right. All right. Okay, so here I've got my three notebooks that I've already kind of lined up, um, and. Uh, I don't confuse myself by looking at the wrong screen. I can do this right. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do um, is I'm going to, in this notebook, I'm going to show you how you can leverage the interactive queue to launch a job. And inside that job, we're gonna use Dask MPI with a shifter container to streamline and accelerate the launch of the cluster. And then um, we'll do a little connecting to the Dask to the cluster, and then I'll show you what happens when you, uh, when you bring up the dashboard, okay? So like I said, there's a whole bunch of documentation inside these notebooks. And so here is basically a one-liner, even though it's spread across many lines, of how you can actually submit a single um, Dask MPI job if you want. You can put this into a script, which I have actually done to kind of streamline my, my demo launch today. Uh, there we go. And um, I'm going to ask for um, 10 nodes. Uh, on, on in a reservation. And then I'm going to, uh, at, inside of that allocation, I'm going to run Dask MPI. I'm not gonna go over every line in the allocation or in the job submission here, but the notebook has a line by line explanation of everything that I'm doing in the job submission there. Okay, so in the terminal at the bottom, you can see that the cluster has started itself up and that we are going to be able to connect to it from our notebook here. Um, there's a couple of things we need to do right before we set up. Here I've recommended some settings that you should put into a configuration if you wanna do that. Mainly it's about avoiding spilling to disk because we don't have local disks on our compute nodes. Um, and also setting up a link that allows you to actually connect to the dashboard here. And that's another thing that you can stick into the configuration file if you don't wanna have it here in the notebook. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes there's waiting. <laughs> I'll say I'm doing, I'm doing something that I didn't really recommend, which was that I'm launching this out of um, a Jupyter kernel that, um, is a conda, a conda environment that's in my home directory. So if things are bad on the home directory right now, um, I could be having a bad time. But why don't we go ahead and just at least do something. Let's see if we can get this to, to come back up. Okay, all right. All right, that worked. All right, and then, this is the part where we actually start the client and we get to the 
And so I printed out what the uh, a little widget that shows you what the client and the cluster look like. And there's this link here, which if you used Dask before, it might have showed something that kind of didn't work. But now it works, okay? Because what it's doing is it's proxying through to the dashboard on the compute node. That's why the URL looks like it has this kind of 10 dot IP address in it. And it opens up in another tab and you can, you can look at the dashboard there in that other tab if you like, but we've also installed a lab extension that you can just paste that into. And it's kind of nicer because uh, what it does is um, it brings together the dashboard and what your notebook is doing into, oh, did I click something bad? My screen sharing is pipes. Accidentally paused the screen share. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. So, um, and you can bring up little pieces of the of the dashboard here by clicking on things like um, the task stream, which there are no tasks yet, um, and maybe the progress bar. You can bring those two things up. Okay. So they're kind of squished now. So let me move this up here so that I don't have to take up all the real estate. All right. Okay, so we've started up a cluster and we've connected to it, all right? Let's do something with it. So the first thing I'm gonna do with uh, this other notebook is I'm gonna use the same cluster. I'm gonna connect to it and we're gonna calculate pi. And the way we're gonna do this is using the dartboard method. We're gonna use about 100 billion darts to estimate pi on these 320 workers that I've started up. So let's get our connection here. I wonder if I have to restart my kernel in this one too. Why don't we do that? Actually, I should be able to see. Oh, it says I tried to connect. Ooh. Live demos. Let's try the same trick. Switching networks. All right, perfect. Okay, 319 workers. So we're going to do this as a map reduce kind of calculation. So this is the map part, which just says, give me a random number generator and some number of darts to throw, and I'll do it, and I'll figure out how many of them are inside the unit circle in the first quadrant. Okay, so um, here's the part that actually does something, because here we just wrote a function, right? But here, we're going to use the client.map function to actually tell all of the workers, hey, do this however many times it needs to be done to get to 100 billion of these. So we'll get that started, right? And so the, it looks like nothing's happening, but what actually happens is the scheduler is trying to figure out how it's going to schedule all of the tasks that I request. And then when they get started, they show up there in the task stream. So each of these tasks is taking in about 700 milliseconds or so. The overhead for scheduling each one of these is about one millisecond. Okay, so that's handy to keep in mind. It's not a good idea to have a million tasks that each take like half a second or something because that's a lot of overhead. For the reduce part, that's just going to be dividing by the total number that we threw and then estimating pi. We'll do the reduce part there. That goes out to the cluster and gets those values summed up. And then we're good to four parts and 10 minus seven. Okay. All right, so that's really simple. So that's just map reduce. Um, and we didn't use any kind of fancy Dask um, data structures there. We just um, wrote some Python stuff and we shipped it off to the cluster to do some stuff and we brought it back. Let's do another notebook. This is the last demo. And uh, out of an abundance of caution, let's just do that preemptively. What we're going to do here is we're going to make a thing called a color color diagram. We're going to make actually a two dimensional histogram of um, two colors, basically, um, the ratio of two colors. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to load up some data, about a billion rows of data, I think, and we're going to select it um, based on a signal to noise cut. And we're going to select a particular type of object from the DECAM legacy survey. This is a public data set. Now I've gone ahead ahead of time to speed up the demo. I've reformatted some of the data into HDF5 so that we don't have to sit here for 15 minutes to load up a whole bunch of uh, FITS files. 
Um, and we're going to use DAS data frames to do this. So let's uh, connect to scheduler. All right. So you can see that the, the dashboard reacted there. Restarting the scheduler cleared out everything that we had done before. Here's the data frame call. Now, if you've used pandas before, this should look pretty familiar. Um, the API is supposed to remind you of pandas, but it's got some extra arguments like this chunk size argument, which tells it how much data to put on each uh, partition when it loads up. Then to actually do the load up and redistribution of the data across the workers, because it's probably not optimal, um, we do this repartition and persist business here. So here the data is being loaded from HDF5, it's being loaded from scratch. Uh, I've noticed that when you try to load data directly off of project, um, they don't all kind of start at the same time, whereas they all seem to kind of start the load much, much, much closer together in time on scratch. I thought that was interesting. Okay, so um, now let's do some, some data science. We've loaded up about a billion, billion and a half rows, I think. We've got to compute our signal, estimate our signal to noise. Okay. And you'll see the cells are coming back immediately each time I hit them because all they're, they're not actually returning anything through the, the scheduler. They're just sending to the scheduler, hey, build the links between all the tasks that need to be done to do this. Let's compute. This is the part that computes colors. It converts from flux into magnitude and then does a subtraction. And then we apply a signal to noise cut. Uh, so we only want good data. Okay. So since that persist call, nothing has happened on the cluster yet. We're just telling the scheduler, hey, this is the order in which we want things to be done. Here's my function for doing the two-dimensional uh, histogram. There's not a two-dimensional histogram function in Dask, but it's pretty easy to write one yourself. But the stuff that comes in is a data frame, or actually it's a, a future of a data frame, but you can operate on it like it's a regular old Dask data frame. And then down here, this is the part that actually sends out the heat map calculation to all the partitions to be done. And then, again, still nothing's happened yet until I do compute. And this is the part that brings them all together. So we're basically doing a similar kind of reduce operation over all of the data, over all of the partitions. So this should be um, pretty fast as well. Okay, so when this is done, we're going to have the sum over all partitions in this two-dimensional histogram. And uh, let's see, can I plot it? Here it is. All right. So if you're an astronomer, that's a color color diagram. All right. So those are the live demos. And again, they're going to be um, shared uh, on the web. And in fact, we'll try to make it so that you can start them up yourself in a Jupyter notebook. And we'll, we'll be adding. Um, other, other notebooks as well to the documentation to try to help people out. Um, a couple questions that might be in people's mind at this point is, you know, why would I use this and not say MPI? Um, I think that, you know, MPI is great. It tries to bring MPI into Python and that's like something that people really need and it's great for that and it, it scales. It will scale up to the whole machine. Um, Dask isn't going to do that. So, you know, why would you do this? I think that one of the reasons is that the API tries to look like a Python API. So it, it works nicely and it interoperates with all of these tools that people know and love. And MPI for Py is about bringing MPI to Python. And that's a different thing. Um, it scales out very well. You can dynamically add workers, take workers away, and the thing keeps running. MPI processes are kind of fixed. And if one of them goes down, well, they all kind of go down. Um, Dask scales down, meaning you can just run Dask on your laptop or on a single node if you like, and it's just a pip install. Um, some people can find installing MPI on a laptop to be a little bit daunting. Um, it's also highly responsive and it has that really uh, cool dashboard. It's really meant for interactive data exploration where MPI is about parallelizing processes in jobs. Now, um, while MPI for Pi you know, uses Crane InPitch to talk over Aries, um, and can scale up to all of Query Dask, just won't do that. Um, I've run Dask clusters at NERSC up reliably up to about a thousand workers. Um, that works pretty well. When I've tried to push it to maybe seven or 8,000 workers, um, the cluster never kind of fully comes into being. But interestingly enough, when you submit work to it, it all gets done. Um, people who use MPI just would never put up with that. 
um, it'd be highly inefficient to try to run that kind of workflow. Um, and another thing to think about is it has this central scheduler and um, Spark kind of has, has a similar kind of architecture. Um, one millisecond worth of overhead and that's going to influence how much work you do, um, how much, how much, how big of a task you actually want to have um, and how many tasks you want to submit to the cluster. So it's not a good idea to submit a million um, one millisecond tasks, for instance. Um, okay. And Dask versus Spark, I've mentioned Spark a few times. Um, there's a lot, Dask is a lot more like Spark than, than MPI and MPI for Pi. There's reasons why you might use one and not the other. Um, there's a whole page on, on why you use Spark versus Dask uh, in the Dask documents. I think it's fairly, um, I think it's fairly fair. Uh, so this is, this is gonna be the end of this talk. Um, so today, just to, Recap, we've seen a way that you can use Dask on Jupyter at NERSC and use the dashboard, which everybody seems really excited about. Um, we're gonna continue extending and enhancing the service. We're gonna try to work on better integrating the start cluster thing, you know, which was that huge one-liner um, into the GUI. Um, so that'll be code that we're probably contributing to the project. Um, we'll be working on our documentation. Right now we have one page that where we've kind of just gotten started. We're going to be adding profiles so that um, what that means is that it will be easy for you to select and specify a configuration without having to rewrite the configuration files all the time. And um, it should be, in general, easier to, to use Dask at NERSC over time. And if you have any questions, please file a ticket, either a Python ticket or a Jupyter ticket. We'll figure it out um, at help.nurse.gov. And of course, we're working on our documentation at docs.nurse.gov. If you discover things that are valuable to other users and you want to add them, you can contribute to our documentation as well. That's all I've got. All right, well, any, that's great. Any questions? Hi, this is Stephen. Um, so in this case, you launched the cluster from the command line and then separately went over to the notebook to connect to it. Is there a reason for doing that versus launching it directly from the notebook by spawning out the command and then shutting it down from the notebook as part of sort of a self-contained ecosystem or is it necessary to do it separately? It is not necessary to do that. You could run it as a separate process uh, from within the notebook. One reason that I like to, um, in, in the experimentation that I've been doing with Dask, run it in a separate terminal is that I can, um, I can more easily start and stop things, I think, um, just control C. Um, and I can also um, kind of follow what's going along when things are, um, are going awry. And, um, and, you know, as you can imagine, I'm probably, I'm starting and stopping these all the time, trying to experiment with ways to make this work. And just taking the, um, I would say that making it integrated with the notebook or integrated with the lab extension, which is, I think, the direction we really want to go. I think that that's probably something I would worry about getting right later on personally. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of, a, I find it a little bit more convenience while I'm hacking to be doing that. But in production, I probably want it to be integrated into the flow of the notebook. Um, there is one thing that I have noticed about Dask MPI, and, and it's part of the reason why I, I run it in a terminal, which is that if I crash the cluster, like I oom it, or intentionally crash the scheduler or something like that, the scheduler coordination file seems to get left over. And if I start up again, it looks like the workers actually seem to read that file and they try to call home to a scheduler who's dead. And so the cluster kind of just sits there. So I wanna be able to see kind of in the same window, um, do I have that scheduler file around? And we're, work, we're working on um, fixing that and contributing it back to the Dask MPI code. So that's kind of a long answer, but I'd say if you're happy with uh, integrating it into a cell and just running it either with a magic or a subprocess call, that, that should be just fine too. Okay, thanks. And actually, it, it also looked like you connected to the same cluster from two different notebooks. Um, in this case, you did it one at a time, but could those have been interleaved, having several notebooks talking to the same cluster and it just, Dask magically interleaves everything and gets the answer back to the right notebook. It would, it would, so it would definitely get it back and forth to the right notebook. 
Um, would it magically interleave? Um, I think it would. Um, would you wind up possibly if you had too many notebooks using the same cluster, um the notebook or um the cluster? Probably not. Yeah. But since I, you know, um, I, I was trying to uh, save time here, and so um, I wouldn't recommend in general like just having one one cluster and multiple notebooks talking to it. But if it turns out that users find that to be a really useful way to do it, then that's great. Cool, thanks. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time.